You've probably heard of carnivores, herbivores, and even omnivores. But what's a locavore? Coined in 2005 by Jessica Prentice of the San Francisco Bay Area, a locavore is a person interested in eating food that is locally produced, not moved long distances to market. The locavore movement in the United States and elsewhere was spawned as a result of interest in sustainability as well as eco-consciousness. Jonathan O'Dell introduces us to this growing diet trend. This spread has, has really caught fire around the country. In recent years, people have become increasingly aware of where their food comes from. We're down here today at the Phoenix Open Air Market to check out some local vegetables. So farmers markets like this have been cropping up everywhere. People want to know that their food's coming from a, a local source, they're supporting local businesses, um, but also that the food is pesticide free. They want to know where it's raised, they want to talk to the farmer um, instead of the big industrial stuff or, or things that you get at uh, a grocery store. What's interesting is when you go to food markets like this, you start eating seasonally, the things that are available in season uh, and where you're living. And so the, the seasonality of food has come back, unlike a grocery store where you can get pretty much any product year round. Um, and then of course it's shipped worldwide to that grocery store. Some people become locavores for health reasons or simply because they believe that local foods taste better. Many locavores find that their diet helps them learn new things about the food they eat and the community where they live. But there are other benefits to consider. Some of the benefits to buying your food local is that your money stays local. In addition to that, you'll be able to find produce that you won't be able to find in the store. Like today, I bought an heirloom tomato that I'm not going to be able to find in other stores. Farmers markets are one of the most important shopping venues in the local food movement. Farmers sell their meats and poultry, dairy, eggs, produce, and other items to local consumers. Shoppers also have the opportunity to talk to the farmer who grew and produced the food being sold and ask questions about pesticide use and farming methods. Depending on where you live, there are many options for buying local food. In addition to farmers markets, locavores also shop roadside and farm stands, winter markets, food cooperatives, community supported agricultural groups, and sometimes at supermarkets, just like the rest of us. In addition to buying your produce locally, John's going to show us another way to eat locally. In addition to buying your produce local, I'm going to head over to Encano Park and show you another way you can also eat locally. Yeah, we stopped here at uh, Encano Park. We're less than five miles from the open air market we were just at. Uh, and the reason is, is because this is kind of the overlooked uh, locavore opportunity. Uh, we're here at Encano Park uh, with trout fishing. Um, this lake is, is stocked annually with trout, catfish, bass, sunfish. Um, and it's really the overlooked opportunity. There's a, uh, an interesting paradigm shift when you start to look at the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Uh, in a new way as, as it relates to food. Um, the department is actually probably one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, meat producer in the state. Um, I was looking at the numbers a, a while back and, and in 2013, uh, we actually harvested over a million and a half pounds of elk meat, um, which is pretty astonishing. Probably annually, uh, the Game and Fish Department has enough meat harvested from fish, fowl, uh, game animals and all that that uh, we could probably feed everyone in the state of Arizona at least for a day. So when you look at wild game and fish meat, it's, it's local, it's organic, it's free range, it's uh, grass fed, it's all those things that we've, when you're looking for those kind of meats, it's already there. And besides that, it's some of the leanest, most protein packed, nutrient and vitamin rich meats around, um, a lot healthier. Yeah. The average American diet uh, really is about four to eight meat uh, daily. Um, you know, your, your standards beef, pork, and chicken, of course, turkey. Um, if you're lucky, you'll move into things like lamb, duck, uh, fish. Now that we've got our fish and veggies, it's time to put them together for tonight's meal. We meet up with John in the kitchen for stuffed trout. Okay, now we're back from the lake. Um, we've got two really nice trout from uh, Encano Park, and then we've got some uh, produce from the Phoenix Open Air Market. What we're looking to do is make stuffed trout. Um, and uh, the way we do that is we'll be butterflying the trout, which is removing the bones from them. Uh, that's usually one of the toughest parts of fish, but um, hopefully we'll make it a little easier for you. We've already cleaned it here, but what we still have is this adipose fin. Surprisingly, this has uh, quite a few bones in it. 
We're going to run the knife on each side of it just to be able to remove it. And we just delicately work our way down. If you can go all the way to the backbone, you'll feel it on the inside. Um, but if you work on either side of it, you should be able to work down to the backbone. And once it connects on the other side, it'll pull it right out. So now we're left with all the rib bones. John explains his favorite technique for removing these delicate bones. You just try to slide the tip of the blade underneath the first set of rib bones, working out towards the head, and working tight to those bones as I start to slide up. We'll get to the end and they come right out. We just do another set, usually about four or five bones at a time. Works out real nice. Repeat the process with the remaining bones on this side. Flip over and repeat on the next. Okay, so now we've got all these rib bones here. Once both sides are done, use your fingers to feel for missed bones. Get down here towards the tail. The tail gets real shallow, so work carefully. Let the knife do the work. You don't need to pull it very hard. Okay. Up here towards the head. The head comes off next. I'm going to go ahead and just slice through the back right behind the head. Right as soon as it gives. Back gives way to that skull. You should be able to cut it free right away from the bones. Do the same on this side. A little bit attached there. Perfect. The same on the tail. A lot of times, instead of using a knife, I like to use my fingers here, but we're going to cut through. And we go right through the tail. And we've got a nice filleted out fish. Okay, now that we've got the fish all butterflied out, we're ready to start the stuffing process. Um, what we'll do first is we'll actually start with our citrus. John's using tangelo instead of the traditional lemon or lime. What's really interesting about uh, tangelo's oranges, grapefruits, they really add a different uh, taste and flavor, a brightness to the fish. And so we'll just add a little bit of tangelo. It was really juicy. I only need a quarter of it for the fish. Um, but it really, you know, it, it helps a lot of people use lime or lemon just for the, the sake of that fishy taste. Um, now this one really won't have a lot of that. Um, but the next thing we'll do, let's add uh, a little bit of salt and pepper. Just season them to your own taste. Do the same thing with some salt. But um, we'll start, we'll lay out some of our fresh spinach greens on the one half, just to add a different dimension to the fish. Kind of like a fish salad almost. Um, we want to add some tomato, that nice heirloom tomato we got. So we'll get a little bit deeper in there. Okay. To put our stuffed trout. So I'll go ahead and cut two of these in half. Lay them over. Right there. Just trying to cover them over there. Um, next we'll add a little bit of dill. Move some of the spinach out of the way. Tomato to give us room. I'm just gonna chop some of the dill. Just for flavor there. some olive oil. Drizzle some of that over the fish here. 
We're going to add just a touch of some Parmesan cheese. All right. Now we can actually fold the fish back over. Use toothpicks to hold it all together, and you're ready to make the baking pouches. Make sure each one's going to be long enough for the fish. A little short. But you'll lay your fish on them. That will be perfect. I'm going to do just a touch more olive oil on top. And a hair more salt just to give that nice skin good flavor to it. So we fold it over. Just creating a little pouch. You're just folding the edges up. Now by now you've also got your oven preheated to 350 degrees. And what these will do is they'll just sit on a cookie sheet in the oven for about a half an hour. I'll turn this one this way so you can see. Fold it over edge to edge. Just get a little bit there. One more time to seal in all that. Place them on the cookie sheet. And they're set to go in the oven. All right, so we got the fish all done now. Let's take a look and see how they turned out. Let's open this pouch again. Nice and steamy. Oh, there we go. pieces there. All right, now you need to cut it open. Pull this off the side. Pull these toothpicks out. Lovely fish. Trout cooks up really, really nice. Get a little bit of that in there. Really excited about that. Bite of that fish. Mmm. Mmm. Hot but good. <laughs>